Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282, it's The Savage Nation, honored as always to be in for Dr. Savage, I'm Michael Del Giorno from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Savage will be back tomorrow for you. Don't forget, it is not too early to pre-order your copy. Uh, I can tell you that the staff, and uh, I kind of consider myself borrowed staff, uh, Michael has been on this journey for the better part of a year, researching and putting his thoughts together. And his new book is God, Faith, and Reason, and it is not too early to pre-order your copy. And I know I'm looking forward to getting mine. Well, welcome into today. There's no question that we have three or four clearly top stories, right? And if I'm Michael Savage or if I'm Michael Del Giorno filling in for Michael Savage, it's my job to go through these top stories and together we all reason and together we all understand and together we put into perspective. And thanks to a kneeling House of Representative pandering member, thanks to the cancellations of DirecTV and NFL Sunday ticket and not to mention ratings being down 11%, the NFL is still in the news. Um, I don't know how Michael has addressed this issue with you. I can tell you how I've addressed it locally in Nashville. I can't unlearn. Most of us fail in life, not because we don't know what to do. We don't do what we know. We have the information. We fail to live it. All right. Now, I will tell you, there is a big difference between ignorance and stupidity. When someone is ignorant, it does not mean they're stupid. It means they're ignoring. They're focused on other things. Sometimes it's shameful how much I can tell you about sports and not tell you about biology or not tell you about science and other topics. They don't interest me. I ignore them. They bore me. I'm ignorant. Now, if it comes to Islam, I'm not. I have studied the Quran. I have studied the Sunnah. I have read the Hadith. I have studied 1,400 years of history. I am not ignorant. Now, here's the problem. In America today, we don't distinguish the difference between facts and feelings, opinions and real study, real understanding and real facts. In fact, you could have somebody as brilliant as Dr. Savage discussing issues that he has literally spent in a master's doctorate degree of current events and understanding and then some moron who gets his understanding from a meme from a pot-smoking cousin on Facebook. And we're supposed to treat them as equal. So I'll give you an example. We're going to talk about the NFL next half hour, not this half hour, because I requested to start with something different, but to use it as an analogy. Somebody walks up to me and says, what do you think of all this NFL stuff? It's not a specific enough question. What do you mean, what do I think? You see, the National Football League and some of these athletes haven't learned... Yeah, you have a right to do this, but that doesn't make it right. Just because you have the right to do it doesn't make it a noble, righteous thing to do. And it will not eliminate the consequence that comes from it. When consequence arrives, whether it's losing 11% of your audience, whether it's people canceling their Sunday ticket. Or whether it's people not buying hats, not buying T-shirts, not buying tickets. Our republic, our nation didn't fail. And our founding fathers' intent didn't fail. Oh, they have a right to do it. But they also reap the consequence. And that doesn't make those people hateful. Can't have it both ways. So you ask me, what do I think of this NFL thing? I think the NFL allowed a Colin Kaepernick problem to become a league problem. And I think they're really morons for doing that. Doing that to their product, doing that to their customer base. PR, debacle, nightmare. Now, why don't I support this this entire process? Because it's it's not just. 
if they were using civil disobedience in order to address an injustice, I might even understand. I might still be uncomfortable with you taking it out on the national anthem. But I'd at least understand. The problem is this goes to Colin Kaepernick, which goes to Colin Kaepernick's original intent, which goes to Colin Kaepernick's support for Black Lives Matter, which goes all the way to the streets of Ferguson, really, and Michael Brown. So there's ignorance, and then there's like what? Weapons-grade stupidity. That's the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars. This was our Rosa Parks moment. Are you kidding me? Time out. I know I was born white. But let me just chime in for a second. Rosa Parks wasn't allowed to drink out of a fountain. Rosa Parks couldn't sit with me in a restaurant. She had to get her food at the back door. Rosa Parks couldn't sit anywhere she wanted to on a bus. She couldn't relieve herself in any bathroom she wanted. That was an injustice. Michael Brown was a thug. He just got through robbing a convenience store, and he was trying to kill a white police officer not once but twice. He was the injustice. The justice was he ended up dead. I mean, I wish he hadn't made those choices, and I wish he was alive. But that was not an unjust act. Autopsy proves it. There's portions of Michael Brown's hand and flesh and DNA inside of Officer Wilson's cruiser. How did it get there? Because he was trying to get the gun. There was no hands up, don't shoot. He was charging Officer Wilson. And a grand jury in Missouri proved it. A grand jury by a biased Obama Justice Department proved it. There was no injustice. So what is this really about? I can't unlearn these things. I can't become ignorant in the name of tolerance and all getting along. Or what the left would have you believe today is in the name of celebrating all that is great. Why, George Clooney is praying. He issued a prayer. That somehow we could could just all get together again, be a more perfect union. And that we would never, ever turn our back on the ability to protest. So now it's noble to protest a lie, a false narrative. So what do I think of this? I can't support it. It goes back to Colin. Colin Kaepernick was a distraction in his team, a distraction in his locker room. He was a subpar player. And if you were at an organization trying to have a second or third string quarterback, you could find a lot of guys that could play at his level without dividing your locker room, without dividing your city or being a distraction in your stadium. The dumb NFL allowed a Colin Kaepernick problem to become an NFL problem. What a bunch of morons. I don't know how to get dumb enough to find support for that. But we live in a time where you really don't have to have facts. You don't have to have any sense of truth. You just have an opinion, no matter what it's based on, no matter how moronic. So we'll discuss that later in the show. And I'd I'd love to get your opinions. And it doesn't seem to be wanting to go away. The other is the big race in Alabama. Um, I'm going to say this just the way I said it to Michael's producers before I went on the air. This is not some big, grand, difficult conversation. The question is, what does it say about Trump? And is it a Trump defeat? Well, I think it's a Trump awakening moment. It's a teachable moment. Donald Trump needs to know... He was elected in a referendum election. America wanted an outsider because America lost faith in its politicians. They watched the politicians on the left pander, do nothing, serve themselves. Then they watched the politicians on the right pander, do nothing, and serve themselves. So they were ready for a non-politician and an outsider. So Donald Trump represents an outsider defeating the establishment Republicans and 19 of them in a primary. And then thanks to the idiots at the DNC, they don't go with their outsider socialist Bernie Sanders. They rig the primary with super delegates and feeding questions and debates and everything else to get the ultimate establishment Hillary Clinton as his opponent. And then he wins the presidency. outsider explains Donald Trump being president of the United States. But if he thinks that Trump's real grassroots worldview 
culture, collective, individual values and beliefs, the organically born Tea Party movement, he's sorely mistaken. Everyone will try to tell you this was a huge defeat for the president. Why? Because those in control of the narrative and the mainstream media want to make everything about the president. It's not. It's a huge victory for grassroots conservatism in the Tea Party movement. It trumps Trump. And you don't really need a talk show host to explain that to you, do you? And I do think in the end he'll get more out of Judge Roy Moore than in like worldview than he would have ever out of Luther Strange. Which brings me to the other lesson that I don't know how many times, I, you know, I'm respectful of the president, but listen, he incited things in the NFL and he went too far and I said that was wrong. He's not perfect. It seems like every time I'm filling in for Dr. Savage, we're getting another reminder that Donald Trump's gut is a lot better than the voices whispering in his ear. And when, how many times does he have to learn a lesson to trust himself? If this was some kind of a bone to be thrown to Mitch McConnell... And the establishment Republicans who hate the president, they don't share his desires. They're more like the Democrats than they are the president. Well, great. You just snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. That was a smart move. And then finally, when we come back, um, there's a reason I lobbied. And I shouldn't have to lobby too hard. I mean, this show is all about, you know, borders, language, culture. This should be the top story on this particular show anyway. But it ought to be the top story on every show throughout the day. So we'll get to the NFL. We'll get to the Alabama election. We're going to get to what might be the greatest scandal in amateur sports history. But for my money on this, the Savage Nation, I'm starting with the cost of illegal immigration. Next on the Michael Savage Nation. Stay- Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Is the Savage Nation? I'm Michael Del Giorno in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, filling in for Doctor Savage, who will be back tomorrow. Don't forget to follow all the top stories. Doctor Savage is never really gone; he's never really off. He's always compiling the top stories for you, and you'll find them at michaelsavage.com. So I use a little expression on my local show all the time, and it's just kind of like a stage setter. And I always say, you know what? Behind every headline, and don't try. First of all. If you're living off of headlines, you have intellectual malnutrition. You can't live on headlines alone. And in the biased world in which we live, especially at the print level, the mainstream media, people always say that, but why do you bring up print? Nobody's reading newspapers anymore. Where do you think most of these stories online are coming from? The bias is still there. And 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 they're biased by the stories they choose to cover. What I'm going to show you right after the, the bottom of the hour break Stories they choose to ignore, stories you choose to ignore, angles they choose to cover, angles they ignore, people they talk to, people they would never talk to, the quotes they choose to use, the quotes they would never use. It's all biased. So behind every headline is a story. and You got to go to the story. Oh, the devil's always in the detail, buried about three to five paragraphs in. So I say behind every headline is a story. And behind every story, there's just so much to talk about. That's why I've always loved talk radio more than news radio. And I thought there was far more beneficial understanding and exegete to be gained. So I want to start by telling you a little story, and I have time to do it in this segment. Italians, when we go to funerals, oh, it's dramatic. It starts at the door. Now, everybody has this in common with a funeral, right? What's the worst part about putting a dog down? putting it to sleep, and then going back two day, you know, a week later and picking up the ashes. It's no different with humanity. So the worst moment is finding out someone has passed, then seeing their body in the casket, and then when they close the casket, the finality. And there's a whole lot of drama or different types of expression in between. Well, Italians are very dramatic. I mean, it starts at the door as somebody starts walking in. Ah! 
You're too young. What'd you do? But then after about 45 minutes, after everybody's, you know, dealt with it, then everybody starts being themselves. Everybody starts talking, joking, telling stories. And that's kind of a beautiful moment too, right? Then it just becomes all of us being us, telling stories about my grandmother, how wonderful Jenny was. And it's like Jenny's still there. And then there was one guy who went too far. And all of the joy and all of the celebration of life and all of his focus on his storytelling and using his hands, he decides to put his drink down on my grandmother's casket. And that was it. Now you're having too much fun. The reason I bring that up is I'll play these silly games over the national anthem. I'll play these silly games over billionaire, millionaire players and civil disobedience based in false narratives and lies and ignorance. Do they have a right to kneel? Sure. And I have a right to not buy another NFL jersey or pay for another NFL ticket and I live in an NFL city. You want to stay in the locker room? Sunday, I'm staying home. And America hasn't failed. You had your right and you also get the right of your consequence. Because I know there was no initial injustice. I know Michael Brown was a thug trying to commit an injustice and kill an officer. And I know that Black Lives Matters is a highly funded anarchist organization based in racial hatred. And it has led to the targeting and deaths of police officers. And I got news for you. I'm not watching the NFL because I support Donald Trump the president of the United States. I'm not watching the NFL because I support my law enforcement, the men and women in uniform in every city that's hearing the sound of my voice filling in for Dr. Savage. I choose them over football, but make no mistake. We got a clash of gods and idols going on, but I'm so glad I'm filling in for Dr. Savage today because long before I do any of this NFL stuff, somebody put their drink on my grandmother's coffin and it ends right there. Let me tell you about a story that impacts and affects everyone that is not only an injustice, it's illegal. And what it's costing us and how much you're ignoring it everywhere but here on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. This is the Savage Nation. I am Michael Del Giorno from Nashville, Tennessee, filling in for Dr. Savage, who will be back tomorrow. Don't forget to pre-order his book. He's been working at it a long time. I can't wait to read it. God, Faith, and Reason by Michael Savage. All right, so as I was explaining to you all, behind every headline is a story. And as America, we have got to graduate from the headline business. You can't understand complex issues through a meme. Every now and then you get a meme that's a doozy, but you got to go beyond the headline. To the story. Now, what's significant for me, and I think Rahm Emanuel is a great example out of Chicago today. Uh, Rahm Emanuel is trying to blame this whole NFL fiasco on Donald Trump, trying to get you not to notice on the, how they haven't repealed and replaced Obamacare so that you don't notice the debacle he's created in North Korea. Like, that's his mess made. That's his mess inherited. I could go on and on. For me, I like to say, stop everything. Before we have a conversation about whether millionaire athletes will or will not disrespect our national anthem, how about this story? This might be the most significant story of the day. This might be the most expensive, relevant story to every single person hearing my voice now, and nobody's talking about it. And I got news for you. It's going to impact my life a lot more than Roy, Roy, uh, Roy uh, um, Moore is going to affect all of our lives in the United States Senate. So it trumps that story. This affects everybody. And nobody's talking about it. It's as if it didn't happen. What is one of the most debated issues, not only in this presidential campaign, but in this country? And I'd like to say since Ronald Reagan era, but it was even before that. And is there ever a story that is more ignorant or where the the teeth 
of what I think is a mental illness and a spiritual disorder of what I would call multicultural political correct new tolerance. The most lethal brand of weapons grade stupidity, political correctness. And that's on immigration. Now, how does this work? Well, you know, listen, I'm a loving guy. I'm a very generous guy, a very giving guy. I raise over $150,000 a year for the Nashville Rescue Mission for the homeless in my community. But I go to bed every night and I lock my doors before I go to bed. Why? Because it's my house. Why? Because I have a wife and I have three children. And I want there to be a little bit of a deterrence while I lock and load. It doesn't mean I hate everybody. It just means it's my house and I have a God-given right that comes not from man or the Constitution to protect my wife, my children, myself, and my property. And I got news for you. All these leftists that want the borders to be open and they're trying to rewrite the intent of our republic or the, take away the sovereignty of our nation or law and order in our nation, they're locking their doors too and they probably have cameras and security teams. They're full of crap. And if anybody entered their home, they'd call the police. They wouldn't just start paying their medical bills, feeding them, sending them to college. So how is it any different, right? I live in the United States of America. I'm not a U.S. citizen because the GPS will identify me sitting in the middle of our country in Tennessee. I am because of my oath of citizenry. My belief in our constitutional republic. My understanding of the civics of my nation and my self-governing duty and responsible duty as a part of it. That's what makes me an American. Now, my country is a sovereign nation, and like my home, it has a right to decide who comes in and who doesn't. And if you're invited in or you come in properly, I'm going to be nice, and I'm going to feed you. You're going to have a cup of coffee. You're going to have a lot of laughs. I'm a great guy. You decide you want to just enter in the middle of the night. I am going to shoot you. Well, a nation's no different. We're a sovereign nation with borders. And a sovereign nation has a right to decide who comes in and who doesn't. And how they come in. And what happens to them if they break in. I don't know when the argument like an abortion became about not when life begins, but about a woman's body and her right to choose. But the same thing with immigration. Now you hear everything ignorant. This is what made America. No, legal. Legal immigration made America great. My grandfather would slap us right across the face when we spoke in Italian. And you know what? Long after his death, I finally get it. They're sitting in Italy in their late 20s, early 30s. You know what? They made a powerful decision. They had hopes. They had dreams. I don't know. Hey, maybe this uh, vegetable stand can turn into a grocery store. Maybe when I retire, we'll go near the water. I, I don't know what his hopes and dreams were. I know that he sacrificed his life for our life and my children's life and ever forward their children. One generation had to say, all right, I'm going to give up everything. I'm going to leave here everything I know, everyone I know, with nothing in my pocket to go there. I'm going to sacrifice everything I could have become so that somewhere down the line, children I'll never even meet can have something I could have never gotten. And when they got here, they worked. They spoke the language. They taught the country. I'm not joking when I tell you. You spoke Italian, you get your face slapped. He didn't give up his life for that. Legal immigration. Coming here, not to be here by GPS, but be here in worldview, in ideology, past, present, and future, in buying into everything that is America. That's what made us great. A melting pot. Now you have people come in legal, illegal, refugee, and nobody's becoming anything. We're a melting culture, not a multi, m- melting pot. And everybody comes, brings a God, brings an idol, brings a tradition, brings a way of life that divides us even more and more and more. And the culture is all but gone because every other culture has been celebrated but ours. 
Every other place is celebrated but here. There are people that think it is really noble to just have open borders. That any nation that would decide that somebody can't come in or come in that way would somehow be unchristian, ungodly. Now, this is a nation at war, and there's enemies coming through, too. It's an issue of national security and national financial security and every sector of life. Illegal immigration is wrong in principle. The first step they take on our soil is in defiance of our law. And it's no different than somebody breaking into your home in the middle of the night. And just by being there, it doesn't make them a Del Giorno. You can break into my house, and if you don't get killed, I assure you, you will leave, and you'll never become a Del Giorno. You just happen to be in the wrong house in the middle of the night. Now, we all know why it happens. Left likes the cheap votes. Right likes the cheap labor. Everybody likes to make it a dividing conversation. But at the end of the day, it's a sovereign nation. It has a right to protect its borders. It has a right to, right to enforce its laws. Without law and order, we're chaos. We're anarchy. I've often said I'd never want to be president. But I'd like to run for president of the United States. I absolutely would. And you know what I would make my number one platform? You look at $20 trillion of debt, you look at some of these other costs, I'm going to make you pay for them. Elect me. You're going to get a bill. So today's story is a simple one, right? It was the number one issue in a presidential election less than a year ago. It's still a top three issue every single day we're alive and on the air. And here comes this most significant story And nobody, I haven't heard anybody on television, on radio, I haven't seen anybody on the internet, nobody's talking about it. And that is the cost of illegal immigration. Oh, I know the feelings, I know the opinions, but regardless of your feelings, your opinions, whether it's wisdom or gas, here's the cost. And these numbers don't lie. Behind this headline is a real story and a really big bill. It's an all-new record. We like to talk about records, right? A receiver catches a ball. He's got the most receptions in the NFL. Ah, he's got a record. We had a great rookie, Aaron Judge, get 50 home runs as a rookie. We all talk about the Yankee rookie got 50 home runs. You like records, right? Well, here's a record for you. Illegal immigration. Cost us $135 billion, not million, billion, $135 billion, as in about 28% of our entire defense budget, $135 billion. And, of course, we never bring this up when we're talking about tax. You know, we say, oh, 250000 is rich. Well, it depends where you're at. If you're in Lincoln, Nebraska, 250000 you're living pretty good. 250000 in Manhattan, you're not living so good. I turned down a job in Los Angeles for $300,000. Why? I'd have been poor. So each individual legal immigration immigrant, when you boil it down, costs us about 8000 each. But it depends where they're at. If they're in Los Angeles or New York, it gets closer to 25000 And just in case you're curious of how we get there... We're going to look at the cost to the federal government, to the state and local municipalities, and then come up with our total cost. And it's a lot of things. And it's just what you think it would be. Educating them is a big one. $12,000 a year. Now, I don't know where you live. That may be small. Most places, that's a good private school. $12,000 a year. And it can be up to $25,000 in New York. And the prices continue to soar. Why? Well, they don't speak English. My kids in the middle of Williamson County, Tennessee, there's two teachers for every class. The good teacher is dealing with the ones that don't speak English. The assistant teacher, in many cases, is the one dealing with the regular students. Now, you tell me my kids' education hasn't been compromised. So don't think this number is the only cost. You've got their free lunches. You've got food stamps. Medical, that's number two on the list, by the way, $17 billion. Law enforcement, corrections, health care, Medicaid. 
Now, here's what I want to, I want you to kind of follow. I know I'm kind of run, run short in this segment. I just bought a new house, 5,000 square feet. My previous house was 3,000 square feet. So I knew the electric bill was going to be more. I thought, well, it's not quite double. Maybe it'll be not quite double. My electric bill used to be 300. Now it's 700. Let me tell you something. That bill is big, 700. But if you sent me a bill for $20 trillion, I'd laugh at it, right? That's just, it's so big we can't all put our arms around it and comprehend it. Isn't that the problem? Isn't that where we find all of our grace and all of our mercy and all of our nobleness and all of our liberalism? Because it's somebody else paying for it. Now, you don't realize there's no greater threat, probably greater than Iran, probably greater than China, probably greater than North Korea, probably greater than Russia, probably greater than Islamic Jihad or Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Boko Haram or other other terrorist organizations. The biggest threat to our republic is $20 trillion of debt. And we just throw it around like it's nothing. Like it's not even there. I think, and I mean this before Almighty God and you. I think I fretted my $700 electric bill more than our $20 trillion collective debt. It's as if the numbers get so big, they're not real. But they are. Listen, I don't mind everybody having an opinion on illegal immigration. Never mind you're an idiot that you don't know the difference between legal and illegal. That you're a civic moron that you don't understand self-governance and a constitutional republic and a government of laws and that they matter. But if you're going to apply moral relativism to almighty God, you're going to do it to the almighty Constitution and anything in between. So I'll give you the latitude to be an idiot. I'll give you the latitude to be a moron. To have a feeling over a fact or an opinion over an education. I'll give you all that as long as we're all paying the bill. You see, if I ran for president of the United States, I'd say, listen, I don't know where candidate A, B, or C stands on this. I don't know where you out there in America stands on this. But I will tell you this. Whether you believe in open borders or not, illegal immigrants cost us $135 billion, or roughly about 28% of our total Department of Defense budget. Now, if you want to have open borders, fine. But every household in America, and there's $126 million, I'm taking the $135 billion, I'm dividing it by 126 million households, and the bill's coming in the mail, and you will pay it. Now, once you pay your $1,071, then if you want to be an idiot, be an idiot. I bet you the votes change. I bet you the level of understanding changes. And I'd do the same thing with $20 trillion. I'd say, listen, you guys wanted to double the national debt. You've done this mostly in your lifetime. You're not passing it on to the next one. There's 126 million households. We are $20 trillion in debt. We're going to divide it by 126 million. Congratulations. The second biggest bill in your house is no longer your car. It's now $61,000 per household, and you've got five years to pay it off. People start voting differently. People's opinions would start being different. Maybe the numbers get just too big for us to understand. Well, I got news for you. If you want to bash Trump, if you want to talk about kneeling NFL players, if you want to talk about one Senate race in Alabama, have at it. But you put a drink on my grandmother's casket. And I'd like to remind you, you've all been being and moaning for about three decades over illegal immigration. Well, congratulations. It's never been worse. $135 billion. At least if you're paying for it, you have a right to your feelings and opinions. Until then, somebody should wake up and do something. This is the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. This is the Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Giorno in for Dr. Savage, who will be back tomorrow. By the way, a couple of tidbits before we close the book on the top story that everyone's ignoring. A record $135 billion price tag for illegal immigration in the last fiscal year. Congratulations. It's a new record. little tidbit, up $3 billion 
from the previous year. We're all famous at kicking the can, right? How did Social Security and healthcare get where it is? Kicking the can. How did Iran and North Korea become the problem? They become kicking the can. How did 9 11 happen? Kicking the can. We love to kick the can because we're politicians, not leaders. And for all those that say, oh, but they're paying taxes, only $19 billion. You're stuck with $116 billion. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language. Adult content, psychological nudity, listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Welcome back in to the Michael Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Giorno from Nashville, Tennessee. Our phone number throughout the show, 855-400-7282, 855-400-SAVAGE. Dr. Savage will be back tomorrow, but it's an honor to be filling in. You can follow all the headlines we're covering at uh, michaelsavage.com. And don't forget, it's not too early to pre-order his new book. And a lot of us have been waiting for this for a long time. And Dr. Savage has been... Um, toiling, researching, and putting his thoughts together, and it's finally going to be on paper. God, Faith, and Reason. Pre-order your copy today at michaelsavage.com. All right, as you know, if you weren't listening to the first hour, this won't matter. This won't mean anything to you, but somebody put a drink on my grandmother's casket, and I covered illegal immigration. Now let's move on. I think probably the big question facing everybody in the talking head world or those that follow politics or those citizens that are really following our republic is, you know, was last night in Alabama a defeat for President Trump? I can't believe that no more people haven't gone there today. And then see what the president did, stirring it up with the NFL, and it cost him his guy down in Alabama. Well, I want to make one very obvious statement. I used to love John Madden for this, you know. People used to think John Madden was so profound. Uh, There's a football game, you know. The finality, you you play the game, the game ends, somebody's got more points than the other, and if you do, you're the champion. You know, it's like, oh, wow, that's so profound. (laughs) Last night was a huge victory for Judge Roy Moore. That's who it was a victory for. Not for Bannon, not for anything else. Not not the Trump defeat. It was not a huge Trump defeat. It was a huge defeat for Senator Luther Strange. All right, so you know, somebody on television or radio look into the microphone and go, all right, if you want to know who was the big winner here and who was the big loser, well, the winner was Roy Moore. He's going to the United States Senate. You, know, you sit around, you decide to run, you have a campaign, you run your campaign, you knock on doors, you raise money, you have the election, you win or you lose. He won. So first and foremost, hats off to Roy Moore, Right. Now, this guy's got a story, too. Now, I know that the left views it as a very controversial story. Really? Believing in the Ten Commandments is now controversial. So he disobeyed a federal judge order to remove the Ten Commandments monument. Right there in the courthouse. Then last year, he got in trouble again over gay couples and licenses. So we kick these issues around all the time, but what's the pulse of America? It's not that America hates gays or America's homophobic or, you know, America hates judges. We're a nation under God and a specific God and indivisible and with liberty and justice for all. And for one judge, I mean, isn't it, you know where gay marriage came from? The mayor of San Francisco. Gavin Newsom. Decides he's going to walk out the front door and just start handing out marriage license and civil disobedience. Oh, he's a freaking hero. This judge says, I ain't taking those Ten Commandments down. He's controversial. I guess it depends on your worldview, doesn't it? I guess it's controversial from the view of San Francisco. But you know what? I don't live far from Alabama. It's common sense. It's principle. It's traditional values. It's not controversial to believe in God. It's common. 
It's not controversial to believe in the equal branches of government and to stand up against a cultural war. So I just want to be the first to start the segment off, and I hope it's not oversimplified for the very distinguished Michael Savage Nation audience, because I know you're smart because he's smart. But I wish somebody would look you in the eye and say, uh, last night in Alabama, that was a win for Roy Moore. That's first and foremost. Was that a Trump loss? No, that was a loss for Senator Luther Strange. Now, you want to go beyond that and peel the onion? All right, I'll do it. I'm respectful of the president. I voted for him without blinking over Hillary Clinton. I was never a never Trumper, and he was not my first choice. And he is now president of the United States, and I am respectful. That doesn't mean I always validate, and that doesn't mean I always agree. I had no problem with the president of the United States addressing the NFL players and say simply and profoundly and truthfully, if you'd stop worshiping the idol of football, or you know, God, family, country. When you put football above country, you know, have at it. But I guarantee you, you stop buying their jerseys, you stop buying NFL Sunday ticket, you stop buying tickets and paying for parking and all the food and all the drink. You go with the, to the game with their jerseys instead of buying them and throw them back on the field. They'll start standing up. And owners will start making them. That, I had no problem with that statement. When he adds, you know, and I know there's a lot of people that make this argument, the president never called them SOBs. Well, when you say, I'd make those son of a bees leave the field and fire them, you're calling them an SOB. And politically, that was so obviously inciting. I don't know why he goes there, but he does. So he was wrong to do that. These athletes are wrong to disrespect our anthem because there is no ultimate foundational injustice. Michael Brown was not an injustice. Black Lives Matter is an anarchist, highly funded, racist organization. That's not worth celebrating or choosing our national anthem over. If it was about Rosa Parks, well, now you're talking. She ought to be able to drink out of whatever fountain anybody else drinks out of. She ought to eat in any restaurant anybody eats in. Sit anywhere that she wants to on a bus. That is an injustice. There, I'm with you. But I'm not going to stand with these morons over Colin Kaepernick. And Black Lives Matter and Michael Brown, who's tried to kill an officer and a previous president who's incited the killing and targeting of white officers. I'm not choosing these athletes over my officers. No way. Take your NFL and shove it. Just don't make any mistake about it. I am not doing that to support President Trump. I'm doing that to, pr- to support my law enforcement officials. who, When I'm in bed at night are out in the midst of this and standing between me and harm. But if you want to peel the onions, okay. This is clearly to me that the, the, the organic, real, grassroots, grass-funded, traditional God, family, and country Tea Party trumps Trump. It's a teachable moment for the president. You won an election, a referendum election, The climate was just right. Everybody was anti-politician, whether it was Republican or Democrat. You ran as a non-politician at the perfect time, and you defeated 19 establishment candidates. And that's a movement. But you don't trump the Tea Party. It's still bigger than you. So, was it a big loss for Senator Luther Strange? First and foremost. Secondly, the establishment Republican Party. Yeah, if you're going to peel the onion that next layer. And yeah, it proves the Tea Party trumps Trump. You're a phase. They're a bedrock. You might want to learn that teachable moment. You want want to peel it further? I'll peel it further. The president's got a better gut Then he has voices whispering in his ear. Do you know the last time, I think it was the last time the guys in Dallas might remember, maybe it was the time before I filled in for Michael. We had this conversation. The president was right here in Nashville. And he just got word that they blocked his travel ban again. And he made the most interesting statement that nobody caught. He said, I shouldn't have listened to my attorneys. 
I should have just put the ban I wanted to put in place, and now when I repeal, I'm going to repeal the original ban. I don't know why I listen to those people. And I, and I was one of the few people that was encouraged. I thought, ah, there you go. Now you're catching on. Republicans hate you as much as Democrats. Big governments against you as much as big-time left politics is. You're starting to catch on. And all these little whispers from establishment aides or establishment senators or establishment congressmen or all these people think they know Washington better than you could ever know. Trust your gut over them. Your gut's better than them. He's catching on. But I keep watching him learn the same lesson over and over and over. Now, I'm not a fly on a wall. But I think what most people would agree happened is the president's getting nowhere. And he's got to get somewhere before the midterm election. He's got to get somewhere before his reelection. He's got to do more than appoint a judge. Great judge. But we said goodbye to Scalia. You're only back to even. You got to do something. Well, you're certainly not going to repeal health care. Obamacare. You're certainly not going to replace it. I don't know. You're talking big about tax reform, but everything I'm hearing in the whispers in the vision doesn't look like reform to me. Looks like more redistribution of wealth, and it's aimed even more at me. So what's the guy going to get done? The wall ain't going up. So I, I get it to some degree. You got to get something done before you face re-election, and it'd be nice to have some momentum and something done before a re-election. But why is nothing getting done? Your party, the establishment of your party. I would stop tweeting and communicate your vision to the American people. Set your vision and your standard for what would repeal and why it's necessary to repeal and what would return our health care system and, and not just our actuaries and insurance system back to the direction it needs to. Take it to the American people. Like John F. Kennedy, lay out your case. The taxation is stealing. <laughs> and that morally the money belongs to the people and you trust how they'll spend it. And as they spend it, the economy grows and more taxpayers burden less. That's how you fund government. That's how we prosper. Make your case. But it sounds like, or what most people believe is, he tries to throw a bone to McConnell to support an establishment candidate, and he snatches defeat from the jaws of victory. In the end, he ends up with Judge Roy Moore, who's more like Donald Trump anyway. And then you give the media another chance to make it about you. You know, the media loves that. They don't want to make it about Michael Brown. They don't want to make it about Black Lives Matter. They don't want to make it about the only injustice is black people have targeted white officers and assassinated them. They want to make it about Colin Kaepernick. They want to make it about black history and, yeah, everything but what it is. And they're doing the same thing with this. So I just want to be the one guy on national radio that says, oh, get close to the radio. You want to know what last night's election in Alabama means? It means Luther Strange comes home and Judge Roy Moore goes. If you need to know more, it means that the Tea Party movement is a lot more real than the Trump movement. And that Donald Trump is still not trusting his gut. And he's still listening to all the wrong voices, trying all the wrong tactics. And by the way, for his own edification, he still doesn't have his victory prior to a midterm election and before his reelection. So for all the trying to play with your enemies in the Republican Party, you're still nowhere. Now, can I get on to the NFL? Because I'm dying to rip them a new one on the Savage Nation next. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. This is the Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Giorno in Nashville, Tennessee, in for Dr. Savage, who will be back tomorrow. You can follow all the top stories 
uh, at michaelsavage.com. And don't forget to get your early order in for his new book. He's worked a long time on it, and many of us are very much looking forward to it. God, Faith, and Reason, the latest from Dr. Michael Savage. Get your pre-orders in at michaelsavage.com. All right, well, we're going to talk a little bit about the NFL uh, starting next half hour. I wanted to play. Um, I have a little thing I do locally, and that is every time somebody says something stupid, doesn't mean I have to comment on it. You know what I mean? I played a great clip, um, and uh, I can't remember who the reporter was, but they were interviewing Morgan Freeman. I think it was Mike Wallace. Yeah, Mike Wallace was interviewing Morgan Freeman. And uh, Morgan Freeman says, you're not a fan of Black History Month. He goes, no. Oh, well, why not? He goes, well, you know, go." I don't, do you want a do you want a Christian month or a white month? And he goes, "Well, I'm not white. I'm Jewish." He goes, "Well, do you want a Jewish month?" And Mike Wallace goes, "No." He goes, "Why well, don't want a Black month?" Black history is American history. And Mike Wallace looks at him and says the most incredible thing. He goes, "Well, if we don't have Black History Month, how are we going to fix racism?" Can you imagine such an ignorant statement? What an intellectually, spiritually bankrupt statement. And I loved Morgan Freeman's response. I mean, I could have gone into the psalmist David and were fearfully and wonderfully made by our creator and gifted and purposed and in his image. Say, and race, understanding who we are, who our creator is. It makes a difference. How we're all his creation, it makes a difference. But Morgan Freeman just goes, just stop talking about it. Just talk to me as a person, not a black person. See me as a person, not a black person. You know, sometimes I think we all talk too much. And every time an idiot says something stupid, doesn't mean we should acknowledge it and spread it. I do a greater service ignoring them. But we do have a couple of real heavyweight morons today saying a couple of really what I call weapons-grade stupid things. And they're the setup. Or the latest of why the whole NFL story just simply won't go away. Now, the profound perspective I want to leave you with is. This story may seem sometimes like it's now about Donald Trump. It has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Donald Trump didn't take a knee during a national anthem. Well, it's about Colin Kaepernick. Well, no, that Colin Kaepernick. He isn't playing because he's a subpar quarterback that's created nothing but controversy and division. And nobody wants that in the locker room, in their community, or on their field. I mean, this goes back to Michael Brown in the streets of Ferguson. But everybody's kind of just hijacked it. And to show you how the ignorance plays out, now it's just about, well, you either support civil disobedience or you don't. Well... We all know that they have a right to civil disobedience, but does that make it right? Does the motive matter? I think so. We'll call, we'll talk about it on the Savage Nation next. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. This is the Savage Nation. I am Michael Del Giorno in for Dr. Michael Savage, who is off. He'll be back tomorrow. The phone number, 855-400-7282, 855-400-SAVAGE. And we will get to some calls, I promise. I'm not that long-winded. I will stop talking sooner or later. Follow all the latest headlines and top stories at michaelsavage.com. And don't forget to pre-order his new book, God, Faith, and Reason. All right, well, we covered the top story of the Alabama election, and it was a Roy Moore victory. And it was over Senator Luther Strange. But politics being what it is, yeah, I think it's a defeat for the establishment. Yeah, I think it was a bad tactic of the president to get involved. Maybe he was trying to throw a bone to the establishment Republicans, and he snatches defeat from the jaws of victory. So the left is going to make it as much his loss. In the end, I think he gets a senator that's more of his worldview and ideology. So it'll all work out for him. But the president's still not learning to trust his gut. 
Uh, and then we kind of covered uh, the cost of illegal immigration. We talk about it. We fight about it all the time. But nobody ever wants to look at the cost. And I think the problem with that is you don't pay for it. These numbers are so big you can't conceive them. Your electric bill seems bigger. But trust me, you're paying for it. And ultimately you will. And that's why I said if I ran for president, I would be informing you today, congratulations. Whether you believe in open borders or secured borders, it's costing us all $135 billion, up $3 billion from last year. And who knows what it's going to grow to as we keep kicking the can. And no, they're not paying for it in taxes. In fact, of the $135 billion illegals cost us all, they only chipped in about $19 billion, So we're stuck with $116 billion. I'd send every single American citizen a bill for $1,071 due by December 31st. Then you can have your butthole in your opinion on illegal immigration. So now let's get to the NFL. Um, I like to just, you know... State facts, not feelings. I understand that the two things that are probably going to get our republic destroyed the most is ignorance and apathy. There's no getting around that. I think ignorance and apathy and self-destruction is far greater of a threat than Russia or China, North Korea, Iran, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hezbollah, the Taliban combined. There's an Old Testament scripture. My people perish for lack of knowledge. You really should study that in the original, hist- in the original Hebrew. Because it's not that they get those so stupid that they forget how to breathe and they perish. It's not that they get so stupid that they forget how to eat. The Hebrew word means they're overtaken, overcome, defeated. Oh, the ignorance, the civic ignorance of America. We're less than two out of ten people can name the three branches of government. Where 18% can name more than one of the First Amendment rights that are protected. Now we're all authorities. Once an NFL player starts kneeling, we're all authorities on the Constitution. So I like to get beyond this ignorance, meme, social media, moronic America and just talk a little fact, all right? I have no problem with civil disobedience if, in fact, there's an injustice. Where was the injustice? Well, we got to go to Colin Kaepernick, and then we got to go before Colin Kaepernick. So why was Colin Kaepernick doing it? Colin Kaepernick was doing it for Black Lives Matter and ultimately Michael Brown, which is what Black Lives Matter was doing it for. Now, was there an injustice with Michael Brown? No. Big fat thug robs a convenience store and then tries to kill a police officer, first inside his cruiser and then outside the cruiser. There was justice that day. The officer's alive and the perpetrator is dead. Now, listen, I got news for you. I wish Michael Brown was alive today. I really, really do. I went through some dumb phases in my life. Not that dumb, but, you know, I'd like him to live and learn and become a better person. He didn't. But I will tell you, everybody listening to the sound of my voice today, if you want the best odds of going to bed tonight with a toe tag dead in a morgue, try to try to get an officer's gun today. That's not an injustice. And he never raised his hands, and he never said, don't shoot. In fact, his hands were inside the vehicle. The DNA shows portions of his hand in the vehicle. Why? He was trying to get the gun out of the holster, and it went off through his hand. A grand jury investigation in Missouri and by a biased Obama Justice Department all concluded he was charging Officer Wilson. So it's a lie. It's a false narrative that this whole thing is based on, not an injustice. So if you want to kneel to support people targeting police officers, all right, well, kneel. Now, even if it wasn't an injustice, if there was an injustice, do you want to take it out on the national anthem? I don't know. But you're taking it out on the national anthem in support of an anarchist, racistly funded, destructive Black Lives Matter filled with lies, distortions, and fake news, and the ultimate fake news, and Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin before that. I can't be I can't be that dumb. I'd like to be. They tell me ignorance is bliss. I never bliss. But here's where it's gone. Now it's about Trump. Now it's about all of black history ever. Why the owner I would love to get the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars. He said this was our race of parks moment. You know, that's those moments I wish I would, you know, I'm fearfully, wonderfully made by God, just like my black friends are, you know, but they came out. I wish I was black so I could, I could call him and say this. 
I was hanging out with P.K. Subban, one of the best players in the National Hockey League last night, and the star of our Nashville Predators team. I told him his quote, you should have seen the look on his face. And he's from, France. He's from the Toronto. He goes, Rosa Parks moment. I said, yeah. Imagine, we've gone from Michael Brown to Colin Kaepernick to Donald Trump to Rosa Parks. Now, Rosa Parks, there's an injustice. Do you know how many dear friends of color I have? The notion that somebody wouldn't have let my friend Lyndon drink from a drink fountain I drink from or eat next to me in the restaurant as we go to lunch routinely. He had to get his food at the, in the back alley at the back door. Couldn't sit wherever he wanted to on the bus. That's an injustice. How dare you compare the thug Michael Brown And his attempt to kill a police officer to a woman who was failed scripturally and constitutionally. She had a right that came from not man or the Constitution. And that right was to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if we don't get that, stop reading. No wonder you don't know any of the other First Amendment rights. But here's the notion. Now, for most ignorant celebrities or idiots on the left, It's just the nobility of civil disobedience. That's all it is. That's all they get. That's all they understand. And that's all they support. Well, let me look you in the eye and tell you something. And I'll let Dr. Savage educate you more in his books. And when he's back or, you know, for God's sakes, go back to college. Oh, and I can't go back to college. They'll just indoctrinate you. But, you know, Wikipedia your way. Are you kidding me? They want you to believe that any civil disobedience, any, just the act of it is noble. And anyone who speaks against it for no matter what fact or what noble reason is wrong and anti-American. Well, that's not right. Yes, you have the right to kneel during a national anthem. Yes, you have a right to act in civil disobedience. But that doesn't make your action right. It means you have the right to do it, but it doesn't make it right to do it. And in the case of Colin Kaepernick or the NFL, really, you're going to do this for Michael Brown? He was trying to kill a white cop after robbing a convenience store and wringing the neck of the the clerk. I I can't get that dumb. I want you to play cut um, 13. I want to demonstrate this. I mean, because remember what I'm a fan of civil disobedience. And so no matter what job you're in, no matter what industry you're in, as an American citizen, you have the right to speak out. And that includes the president. But if the president's going to say something condemning a person, an industry, you know, of sport, then he's got to be able to take the blowback that's going to come back. And so LeBron and Steph and any athlete, any owner, it's an open door now. And so they have every right for the same reasons to be able to say what's ever on their mind. Now we'll be able to Maver- see if he can take it. Yeah, Mavericks owner Mark Cuban. All right. Look, I'm a fan of civil disobedience. So no matter what job you're in, no matter what interest you're in, as an American citizen, you have a right to speak. Yeah, you have a right to speak out. You also have a right for the consequences. Yeah, you have a right to speak out, but that doesn't make it right just by doing it. What are you speaking out for? What facts do you have? What injustice took place? See how it's gotten that simple? Now it's just, oh, yeah, well, civil disobedience. I love civil disobedience. It's all about Trump and civil disobedience. Well, I choose America. It's like the scene in Animal House. Gentlemen, I will not stand here and let you criticize the United States of America. Gentlemen, let's go. I mean, what an idiot, right? There's no nobility in and of itself. Nobody argues you have the right to breathe. Nobody argues you have the right to be civilly disobedient. But was there an injustice? Is the cause worthy of the disrespect in everyone you're offending? And may I add, Mark Cuban, that's a two-way street. Let's see if you can take it. When we stop watching the NBA, if you want to be as foolish as Coach Popovich or the NFL has been. Let me give you another clip and another example, and then I'll make my point. This also falls under, and I have to kind of um, do this disclaimer. I'm a big believer in, just because somebody says something stupid, 
Doesn't mean we all have to discuss it. Because sometimes somebody can say something really stupid that takes an hour just to, you know, show how dumb it is. But the media loves to do this, right? Because they just can't stop attacking and they can't find that many people. Most of America either gets this or doesn't get this and they're on a side and you can't move them from that side anyway. But we have dug in the media so far to find a former Chicago Bull. I guess we ran out of current players like LeBron or current coaches like Popovich or current owners like Jerry Jones. So now now we're to former Bulls. (laughs) Former Chicago Bull, Craig Hodges. He chimes in and clip 14. When I look at where we are right now, it's, uh, it's beyond us getting justice in America. It's absolutely time for the Congressional Black Caucus to call for human rights violations that That's have right. occurred past and previously. You know, and I think right now, the civil, it's a civil rights issue within the context of what President Trump said the other night. And as far as hampering athletes to be able to employ or get employment or gain employment. And, you know. So the president's saying, if you stop going to games, if you stop buying their jerseys, They'd start standing up. Now, he did go too far when he called them all SOBs and fire him. But now look what they've turned this. So now we've gone from Michael Brown and the injustice of him not being able to kill a white officer, which is apparently the injustice. He should have been able to kill that white officer. Officer Wilson should be dead, not Michael Brown, apparently. Then it goes to Colin Kaepernick. Then Colin Kaepernick, who is a mediocre quarterback, he would have only been second or third string on a team, but he creates so much division with this crap. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. Divides the locker room, divides the field, divides the community. Yeah, I'll take this guy instead. Now, all of a sudden, Colin Kaepernick must have been blackballed. And so this is about a stance for him. Next thing you know, it's about Rosa Parks. It's about all of human history. Now, apparently, these rich athletes think that Donald Trump is trying to take away their paychecks. Can you believe, can you believe we go here? I'm going to boil it down to this way. Whether you're the Black Caucus representative who took a knee in Congress today, these shameless, pandering politicians and morons, they're ready to... You're going to impeach the President of the United States... Because he called people disrespecting the national anthem SOBs. Good luck with that. I can't wait to hear the precedents. Coach Popovich is going on and on yesterday about my white privilege and how it's meant to be uncomfortable. Look, bottom line. If there was an injustice way back at the beginning of this, it'd be one thing, but there wasn't. Michael Brown was a thug trying to kill an officer. Black Lives Matter is a very dangerous, racist, well-funded anarchist movement that deals always in lies and deceptions and divisions. There's no injustice to justify the civil disobedience. And civil disobedience, yes, is a right, but it doesn't make the reason you're doing it right. And it doesn't mean everybody that doesn't support it is wrong. Now, you have a right to do it, And you also have a right to the consequence. Congratulations, National Football League. Let me tell you how how stupid I think you are. You made a Colin Kaepernick problem an NFL problem. My entire Tennessee Titans team stayed in the locker room. By the way, the owners have realized that was a big mistake. I'm still not going to forget. And I'm still not buying a ticket. And I'm still not buying a jersey. And I'm still not buying a hat. And I'm still not buying a t-shirt. I will not choose these ignorant athletes and troublemakers and thugs. And I don't hold all of them accountable, just the individuals. I'm not choosing them over my police officers, ever. Not that I'm boycotting the Titans over Trump, because it was never about Trump. Only an ignorant media or a moron on social media would think that. I go back to the original intent. Michael Brown, Black Lives Matter, Colin Kaepernick, and how we got here. And I don't see an injustice. This is not about Rosa Parks. And congratulations, NFL. You got lots of people getting refunds, and DirecTV is doing it for NFL ticket. You've got audience shares and ratings down 
The only jersey you're selling is the one Pittsburgh Steeler that did come out in defiance of the team. Though later, I think he was crucified to the point to apologize for it. So remember this teachable moment forever. The day that little Michael filled in for Dr. Savage. Of course you join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. of the day. Yeah, you got a right to civil disobedience. But that doesn't make it right. And there's always consequence. And the NFL is living with theirs. We'll get some of your opinions. Uh, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282 is the phone number. I'm Michael Del Giorno in Nashville, Tennessee. Filling in for Dr. Savage. We'll be back tomorrow. And unfortunately, we haven't learned our lessons on sexually transmitted diseases either. I don't know what you guys are up to, but I I see a lot of penicillin in your future next. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language. Adult content, psychological nudity, listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. From high atop the naked statues on Music Row in Music City, USA, Nashville, Tennessee, I am Michael Del Giorno filling in for Dr. Savage. Proud to be on the Savage Nation. Honored to be filling in for Dr. Savage, who will be back tomorrow. Our phone number, 855-400-7282-400. Savage. Don't forget to follow all the stories we're covering today and the Dr. Savage is covering even from home at michaelsavage.com. A great place to pre-order the copy of his new book. He has been working on this for a long time and there's a lot of people just like me that have been waiting for this book for a long time. God, Faith, and Reason. The next bestseller from Dr. Savage. Never too early to pre-order. I was joking with the guys back in Dallas. Get ready for some real radio now. It's the Saudi syphilis hour on the Savage Nation. I do. I have a great story out of Saudi Arabia, and then I've got a great story from the CDC that uh, tells me a lot about what you guys are up against. Now, see me, I'm just raising kids and pets. I just got a new pet, a lizard, Eleanor. She looks just like Eleanor Roosevelt. And so I'm busy caring for kids and pets, but you guys, someone's being very naughty. And I know because I'm looking at your medical records. I do know that, you know, we were supposed to can the NFL talk. I do want to say one thing from an experiential standpoint. Um, I do think this story really is ultimately a clash of idols. It really is. And and pastors out there listening know what I'm talking about because football has become an idol and it trumps God and it trumps church. Just look at your attendance during football season. So it'll be interesting to see ultimately. That's what the NFL has going for it. Ultimately, there's an idol. Is this going to be the one that crosses the line? We'll see how that plays out. What I just wanted to just say before I move on is Don't presume that all athletes are in on this because they're not. I had the the wonderful opportunity to spend all last night with P.K. Subban. Now, I was a fan of P.K. Subban when he was with the Montreal Canadiens. I don't know if that's the proper way to do it, but I like to sound like I'm from that area. (laughs) So I throw in a... And, um, you know, watching him backstage, we did a fundraiser for Scott Hamilton, Olympic gold medalist, and his fight against cancer. Had some brilliant comedians. But, I mean, I watched P.K. Subban. My son goes to bed and wakes up every morning with a life-size P.K. Subban staring at him in a fat head by his bed. Uh, you know, I go back to my childhood just to kind of give you a perspective on this. I grew up in Chicago, and there's no question I was a Chicago Cubs fan. And don't get me wrong, I loved Jose Cardinal. I loved Glenn Beckard. I mean, I loved Don Kessinger. I loved the Cubs. But my favorite baseball player 
was Roberto Clemente. Uh, you know, Roberto uh, was everything. He was arm. He was speed. Got to 3,000 hits as early as anybody in Major League Baseball history. I think, you know, and I don't like to do superlatives because there's just too many of them, but I don't think you can make a list of three of the greatest all-time baseball players and don't put Roberto Clemente on that. And I had giant posters of him in my room. I used to look at those posters in the morning. I used to look at him before I went to bed. I stood in front of that poster weeping when some guy on television told me he was dead. He was as great off the field as he was on, and he died on a humanitarian trip. Oh, man, I loved Roberto Clemente the way my son loves P.K. Subban. If I'd have ever had a chance to spend a night with Roberto Clemente, are you kidding me? And so, you know, and I want you to know that P.K. didn't do it just to be nice because of me. I mean, this is just who he is. And, I mean, he signed his Predators jersey. He took pictures with him. He sat on the couch and talked to him for an hour. My son was doing his card tricks for him, for P.K. Subban. And P.K.'s having conversation. And at the end of the night, he puts his fist down. He goes, Nick, I got to go. I got to get up early and go to practice. And he touches his fist to Nick's, looks him right in the eye, and he goes, you remember I love you. Then he looked at me and said, how do I get one of my fat heads? I'm like, are you kidding me? (laughs) You don't know there's fat heads of you? But we have some great, great heroes out there, some great athletes. I just want to caution you as all this is going on. Don't be like all these other morons that are confusing the right to civil disobedience with, is it a right cause? Was there an injustice? And don't lump all athletes together. That's why I always said the best thing we do is show up with the ones that are doing it and throw their jerseys back. But there are some great athletes out there, and they are living right, and they're good heroes. And, And when our kids get a chance to meet them, they handle it perfectly. So I want to salute P.K. Subban and remind us all not to lump all athletes together. All right, let's get on with our Saudi and syphilis hour on the Savage Nation. Which in Dallas right now, they're going, he said it twice. That's twice, I think, he said Saudi syphilis hour. Behind every headline is a story. Behind every story, there's so much to talk about. Headline, Saudi Arabia agrees to let women dry. Now, of course, you know, I have studied the Quran. I have studied the Sunnah, the life of Muhammad. I have studied the Hadith, and I have studied 1,400 years of history, including the entire life of Muhammad. I can't unlearn that stuff. I can't be as dumb as the teachers in Williamson County want my kids to be while they teach the talking points of the Muslim Brotherhood. And then today, after three and a half weeks of studying Islam, like it's catechism, they get a video on a Catholic blonde girl who converts to Islam. I mean, it's don't get me started on how wild I am today. So this is the New York Times version of this. Saudi Arabia announced Tuesday that it would allow women to drive, ending a long-standing policy that has become the global symbol of oppression of women. In the ultra-conservative kingdom. You mean the ultimate, the ultra-Islamic Sharia law kingdom? You mean their inability to drive? That has been the global symbol of oppression? Not genital mutilation? Not when you remove the clitoris because they have no right to have any sexual pleasure. They're merely an object of pleasure for their husband, a possession. You mean the fact that in a courtroom, they're one-fourth of a witness, a person? You mean there was no se- there is no sex slavery? No women are getting beaten? No women are being put to death? You mean the fact that they can't even pick their husband? You know, I mean, I don't know how dumb I'd have to be today to say, well, geez, they're not allowed to go to school. They're not allowed to walk into the mosque and sit with their husbands. They're not a full person in a courtroom. I mean, it doesn't matter if they get raped. If five guys say, oh, I wasn't raped. Uh, we said a little abracadabra prayer, and she was actually my wife for about 20 minutes. Somebody's walking around thinking that the ultimate symbol of oppression of women in Sharia law and Islam is their inability to drive? 
They're not free to choose their belief. They can't speak against Muhammad or they're killed. They have to be money of, I mean, Aisha was six years old when Muhammad married her. Nine years old when he consummated it. Now, I can tell you this, and I don't mean to be uh, inflammatory in any way. First of all, recognize I'm a Christian. All right, so I have a Savior. I have a Messiah. It's Jesus Christ, and I believe God so loved all of the world that he sent his only begotten son. So I'm going to naturally view Muhammad as a false prophet and Islam as a false religion. You shouldn't need me to validate your religion in order to understand I'm tolerant. But, you know, don't be shocked by the things I say. But that's literal. It happened. He married a six-year-old and he started having sex with her at nine. I don't know. That's that's a pretty oppressed childhood. Well, the woman can't pick their husband. They can't pick who they date. They can't go to school. Up until now, they couldn't drive. Genital mutilation. One-fourth of a witness in a courtroom. Sex trading. Honor killing. Beatings. I mean, I've often said, how do all these leftists do it? You know, these leftist stars with their sophomore high school education walking around at the te- you know on the teat of political correctness pointing out everything in america and ignoring this and then finally you get this story oh they're allowed to drive well that makes it better yeah that is that I don't know about anybody else, but in all my years of study of Islam, well, that's what I had as the global symbol. They can't drive. Why, they couldn't rent a U-Haul. How oppressive. Never mind being physically altered, butchered, beaten, stoned to death. It's like the theme of my show today, right? How dumb do I got to be to be bliss? How do they write this with a straight face? How dumb do they think? Wikipedia would condemn this. But that's progress. I like the next line. The change, which will take effect in June of 2018, maybe, was announced in royal decree, read live on state television. And in a simultaneous event in Washington, the decision highlights the damage that the ban on women driving has done to the kingdom's international reputation. And it hopes for public relations benefit. Yeah. Never mind the rest of the story. You know, I like one news story said it this way. It's a different source, but I love, you know, they're doing the whole the whole same phrasing. And then they go, despite this advance... Women in the country still face many restrictions, including being unable to get a passport, unable to travel abroad, unable to marry without the consent of a male relative, unable to look another man in the eye, unable to utter anything negative about Muhammad, unable to go to school, unable to maintain their clitoris and their genitalia. I mean, you know. Oh, uh, wait, wait. I mean, I just I, I want to stop the show right now. And I, I just I, I can't bow enough to Saudi Arabia for this amazing lifting. Of oppression of women, allowing them to drive. As I re-ask myself, how dumb do I have to become? That being the Saudi Arabia portion of the hour, we move on to the syphilis. Now, I have the latest numbers from the uh, Center for Disease Control, and I do think this is not going to get immature or inappropriate. We're going to have a serious discussion about what these illnesses tell me about what's happening in our culture, and it's nothing short of dangerous. Next on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Now, I don't 
don't mind telling you that the stand-up comic in me could do a whole routine on women driving in Saudi Arabia with nothing but, you know, little eye holes cut out, uh, you know, of their head garbs. You know, here in America, we got women, minivans, bumper stickers, cell phones, makeup. Yeah, that's dangerous enough. There, you know, imagine trying to see like Casper the Friendly Ghost trying to drive with those. They may have other issues in Saudi Arabia now. But. I'm Michael Del Giorno filling in for Dr. Savage. Now, I mentioned moments ago about the naked statues. You know, that is something we're very famous for. You would think in the buckle of the Bible Belt in conservative Nashville, Tennessee, what is the symbol of Music Row where all the music is made and all the famous studios are? We have this giant statue. And this statue is all these naked fig, you know, figures. And I, I don't know, they're kind of like doing like the old, um, you know, you do it at Jewish weddings. You all get in circles and they go in different directions. Like all these people holding hands naked. They're just frolicking. Frolicking. I took a few days off. I was down at a, um, at a hotel on the water. And uh, it's amazing how, you know, when people have the choice between a, a body of water or a pool. They choose the body of water. But not this older couple. Every morning I'd get up, I'd have my coffee out on the balcony. They were frolicking. Frolic. It looked like, I don't know, if there were two bathtubs, I guess it'd be a Viagra commercial. But they were just frolicking in the pool. And they were old and they were gray, but they were still so in love. It was like the notebook, only nobody was sick. And they were just frolicking. That's what these naked statues are doing. They're just frolicking. I mean, it just never happens to me. I'm never just in a room of naked people and we all start holding hands and dancing. But that's what our statue is. It's the famous statue on Music Row. Well, I got news for you. Filling in for Dr. Savage, I'm Michael Del Giorno on the Savage Nation. And I'm telling you, I think there's more of this frolicking going on than I'm aware of. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, new cases of sexually transmitted diseases Chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis. I don't know why. You know, I mean, I'm just kind of like, I'm old-fashioned. I mean, I've got this gorgeous wife. I don't know why she married me. I'm fat. I'm, you know, I say I'm fat. Don't picture a fat person. But I'm older. I'm ugly. She's gorgeous. I, you know, I'm happy. She literally, I don't know. You know, people like to sit around and gripe about their in-laws. I like my in-laws. People like to sit around and gripe about their wife. I love my wife. She's my best friend. She's the only one that sees me naked. She's the only one I frolic with. But, I, you know, so I'm living kind of in a bubble, you know, for like 25 years. I'm just with one woman. I, to be honest with you, I didn't think we still had gonorrhea and syphilis. I don't know why I thought that was old. I thought we were beyond that. I thought, I don't know why I just thought, well, that was like before AIDS. Didn't you get syphilis in Vietnam? They're all back. Chlamydia, gonorrhea. Syphilis, and they're back at record levels. Do you know there are more than 2 million new infections last year alone? 2 million? That's a lot of people roaming around. Only those three are actually required by law to be reported to the CDC. So don't even give me Do not translate everything I'm talking about to just sexually transmitted diseases. That's just the three we report. And then we get to HIV, we get to herpes, you know, and all these other things. Um, when we come back, I really do think there's an adult conversation to be had here. I do, to some degree, think there is some speculating, reasonable speculation to participate in. But for some reason, we're right back where we started with, you know, from and battling sexually transmitted diseases. It may say something about the cultural turn we've taken. We'll explore it next. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Welcome to the Savage Nation. I'm Michael Del Giorno in for Dr. Savage. We'll be back tomorrow. The phone number 855-400-SAVAGE. Follow all the stories at michaelsavage.com. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to pre-order his latest book coming out, God, Faith, and Reason. 
Um, we kind of, you know, entitled this hour. It's probably the last time I'll fill in for Dr. Savage, the Saudi syphilis hour. Um, but no, the CDC released the new reports. And, and again, you know, you can begin to speculate. But, you know, we all went through the just say no to drugs. Remember that with Nancy Reagan? And now all of a sudden, well, smoking is, you know, I always I always say this out loud. What is wrong anymore? I mean, people forget this. But when we abandon absolute truth for moral relativism, when we turn away from a God of past, present, and future, the old and the new covenant, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when you turn that to all gods are the same when they're not, or no God is the same as a God, they're not. So most people get, oh, we're becoming a post-Christian culture. As a nation, we're turning away from a Judeo-Christian God and towards more all gods, no gods, whatever's right in your own mind, moral relativism. So we've abandoned absolute truth, which, by the way, moral relativism is an absolute truth. The fact that there is no absolute truth is an absolute. I, I, I could never get further than that. But you trade a God for a failed philosophy, you're going to get chaos versus God's plan or what has worked in cultures historically. But at some point, you just wake up and you're like, now we can't figure out what bathroom to go to. Now we can't figure out what locker room to go to. Now we can't even play the, we can't get to the national anthem to even play the game. I mean, it just gets chaos and crazy. And sometimes you'll ask yourself, well, is anything wrong anymore? I mean, is, is anything wrong? And I think it's just smoking. I really do. Fat may be next, but right now it's just smoking. So we live in a culture that says, oh, it's okay to fornicate, have sex before marriage. Just make sure you wear a condom, and then it's okay. Oh, it's okay to get divorced. Just make sure that your family blends, you know, as you keep adding other broken families to make your new families. Now we say, oh, it's terrible to smoke, but it's okay to vape. Or it's bad to smoke, but boy, it's great to smoke marijuana. I mean, I actually live in it. I grew up all my childhood. Don't smoke pot. Now I hear, don't smoke cigarettes and smoke pot. I don't know what's right or wrong anymore. And so I think we've, you know, we've come to a point where now here comes chlamydia. Here comes gonorrhea. Here comes syphilis. And you're like, I'm 53 years old. There hasn't been a moment in my life I haven't been preached to. Safe sex, safe sex, safe sex, safe sex. Must be somebody's not having it. And when you look at these 20 million cases, this is now becoming, you know, I don't know when something becomes pandemic, but we're getting there. 20 million kids. And chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis are the only three that have to be reported by law. So how worse is it? Who knows? 20 million new cases, and that's just chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Well, how's it happening? And then we know that, well, half of it is young people. So now you're talking 15 to 24-year-olds are half of the 20 million new cases. There's something going on with our youth. You know, we went through this with AIDS, too, right? Everybody was scared, then now nobody's scared. Everybody's having them. Un- you know, why did AIDS spread the most? Well, I didn't want to go take an AIDS test. Then everybody knew I'd have AIDS. Nobody wanted to date me. I don't want to have a sexual trans you know, disease test. Then everybody will know I have one. Who want to go out with me Friday night? So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things to speculate. I've mentioned social media has had a huge impact. We're hooking up with strangers online. In the case of Anthony Weiner, children online. Usually it always has something to do with the drug culture. It usually always has something to do with the prostitution culture. I mean, I guess we could throw in swingers. I mean, you start looking at half of them, half of them being 15 to 24-year-olds. Somebody thinks they know better. Somebody thinks these diseases are gone, and they're not. Somebody's having unprotected sex, and somebody's having a lot of it. And I, I'm beginning to get suspicious it's colleges. Somewhere between colleges and social media. Or somebody that's thinking more about pregnancy than they are about medical safety and the spread or the attraction of a sexually transmitted disease. But welcome, America. You have a record expense for illegal immigration, $135 billion, and welcome. We're back to the days of gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia. This was probably the strangest story I heard in the world. Natalia Bakshiva. What a great Russian name. Natalia Bakshiva. Sounds like a good cook, doesn't it? Hey, did you eat at Natalia Bakshiva's house? Well, 
Natalia was a nurse, and she had a little secret. Natalia and Dimitri, they liked to eat people. They were cannibals. And so they start making people. People pies. They called them meat pies, but they were human meat. And they start selling it to the local cafe. And they get busted. Now, you know, in Italian culture, we sit around, we eat. This is like the highest compliment. If somebody in my family were ever to go, they take a bite of the meatball and they go, Oh, this tastes like Aunt Grace's meatballs. That's the highest compliment you can get. Your balls taste like Aunt you, you think these taste like Aunt... They taste like Aunt Gracie's. Give me a fork and you taste them. And Natalia, she probably go, this tastes like, I don't know, Aunt Morticia's. No, but it is, in fact, Aunt Morticia you're eating. I mean, is it... I'm not making light of this. It's just like every day I wake up. I know the guys in Dallas feel this way, too, because when you do this for a living, this, this is what we consume every day. There's a reason ignorance is bliss and awareness is hell. But sooner or later, you kind of like wake up one day and you go, okay, now, now have I heard of everything? Are we going to top cannibal balls being sold to local cafes in Russia? Now, because we don't have any sense of right or wrong, we also don't really have any sense of consequence, right? I mean, Anthony Weiner was a great example of that. They tried to play Anthony Weiner was the victim. That Anthony Weiner was a victim of a political year. And they were trying to get to Hillary. So they were using him to get to Uma Abedin, to get to Hillary. Why, he's a victim. And you're thinking, and he's texting girls my daughter's age? Trust me, he's safer in jail. But they're playing the victim card for this sick guy. And you're like, is there anything wrong anymore? Well, here in Tennessee, I want to demonstrate this. This is what, if we were local, this is what I call my living in America update. Because each individual one is its own story. But isn't it painting a picture? I don't know when it's going to dawn on America. You know what? This abandoning God thing, it's not working so good. Can't wait for God, faith, and reason. So here in Tennessee, there's the wife of a high school assistant football coach. She pleads guilty to having sex with one of the 16-year-old players on her husband's team. Kelsey admits to guilt on all seven accounts. Why? To cop a deal. If she doesn't cop the deal, she's probably getting 38 years in prison. All right, well, that would send a deterring message. Yeah, that that would be. No, she cops a deal so that she'll serve probably 30% of three years. In the end, one year. What is a 27-year-old woman having sex with a sophomore in high school football player worth? About a year. What that kid's life's worth. Now, don't even get me started on double standards because I got news for you. If it had been a sophomore female soccer player and the husband of the female coach that had sex, or something tells me it wouldn't have gone this well. But that's not even the story. All right. So I don't even know, you know, filling in for Michael. I'm not even addressing one city, I'm addressing an entire nation. I don't even know if America frowns on this anymore. I would hope so. This is the coach's wife having sex with one of the sophomore players. She cops a deal. This is her attorney. Well, we copped the deal to avoid. Otherwise, she'd have faced 30 year, 38 years in prison. Now she'll serve three years and probably be released after 30% of that sentence. So one year. Now listen to this quote. Look, she made a mistake. This is what he tells the newspaper. It's a big mistake. Look, she made a mistake. She's going to move past it. She's young. And as you saw, her family was here supporting her. Her husband is strongly supportive of her. And I'm thinking, where do I live? What, I, what time is this? Stop the world. I want off. This is getting too weird. What kind of a marriage is that? Hey, she did what she could do for the team. I, I, don't, I don't understand what he's strongly supportive of. And then he goes, and she's very sorry. She's sorry about what happened. And she's sorry she put her family through this. Geez, by the time this Fox News story ends, I'm going to think she was the victim. 
Look, how do you boil a frog? Put it into water and slowly turn it up. He'll sit there the whole time and boil alive. God help us. God help us for how desensitized we're getting to evil, to wrong. Now, there is a bit of good news. You're probably wondering, where am I safe? You know where you're safe? It turns out in an elevator. Contrary to the portrayals in movies, whether it's the Clockwork Orange or Hannibal Lecter from The Silence of the Lambs, we can now put to bed, thanks to research, what what psychopaths like to listen to. Now, I don't know how this works. You know, I, I just know my life and what I do for a living. and It's different than a lot of people, but, you know. Who's the guy at the Holiday Inn sitting there at the bar having a drink? So what do you do? I'm studying what kind of music socio- psychopaths like to listen to. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how much of my tax dollars went to fund this, but I don't want to waste it. So everybody's notion or everybody's portrayal in movies is that they like, you know, classical music. That somehow these psychopaths are deep down very intellectual. So they like very intellectual music. But that turns out to not be the case. Hello, America. I'm Casey Kasem, and I have the number one song in the land for so- psychopaths. <laughs> Moving up three big notches this week. If you like the Backstreet number one hit, No Diggity, you might be a, a psychopath. Or how about Eminem's? Lose yourself. They ranked number one and two. Don't even get me started on uh, my Sharona by the knack and what that might entail. I really don't want to pull the Band-Aid off too fast. About 1% of the general population meets the description of psychopath. But the figure is far, far higher in prisons, as you can imagine. So uh, they were testing all this music at the by way of a, a psychologist at the University of Mexico. And it turns out that they like least classical music. Although, I don't know if you've noticed, people stop playing classical music in elevators now. Elevators are just kind of silent. But you would be safe in an elevator with classical music. That's your Living in America update. Um, Again, probably the most serious of the stories is the rise in sexually transmitted diseases. And and by the way, if you talk to the CDC, this will really irritate the snot out of you. Well, when you ask them, all right, those are the numbers, 20 million. What's the cause? Oh, cutbacks in funding. Oh, yeah, that's always money, right? We always need more tax. It's nothing to do with morality. It's nothing to do with character. It's nothing to do with choices. It's nothing to do with the prevalence of drugs or prostitution or social media hookups. You know, lack of character. Oh, yeah, it must have been a government program. You know, because the kind of things you got to do to get these things... I don't think that's that one-tenth of one percent of, you know, because we fail in life, we don't do what we know. It's not that we don't know what to do. This would fall. I mean, everybody knows the kind of promiscuous, debaucherous lifestyle that makes you susceptible to this. But you can always count on a government agency to tell you the solution is more money to the government. That's Living in America. On this uh, Wednesday, September 27th, filling in for Michael Savage. I'm Michael Del Giorno in Nashville on the Savage Nation. We'll wrap it up next. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. This is the Savage Nation. I am Michael Del Giorno from Nashville, Tennessee. Honored, as always, to be filling in for one of my heroes, Dr. Savage. His new book, God, Faith, and Reason, is coming out. It's not too early to pre-order, and he will be back for you tomorrow right here on the Savage Nation. Well, as I always do in my local show, it's Wednesday. And Wednesday in my neighborhood is Trash Day. And this kind of goes back to one of my high school teachers in Metairie, Louisiana, Eddie Cole Classic. You could rile this guy and his lip would start to quiver. He was like a dog getting ready to attack. He'd show his teeth and then he'd like whine up. You're garbage. You're garbage.
ah, bitch. And he would just scream at the top of his lungs. So, you know, in honor of him and then in honor of Garbage Day, I have my loser of the day and I take the garbage out. Well, today's loser of the day is in Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, the mayor, cut seven. There's a part of me that also thinks it was uh, a cynical ploy to distract people from what was happening on health care, what was not happening in Puerto Rico, and uh, what they were attempting to do, as I said, on health care, but also on other on North Korea. Now, why would it make Rahm Emanuel? First of all, who rattled his cage? His city's a mess. His state is broke. His city is crime ridden. Um, Obamacare, Obamacare, of which he began as the campaign manager and then went on to be a chief of staff, is is a failure. It's a failure as a product. It's a failure as a as a government uh, entitlement. It is unsustainable. So you can criticize the Republicans for not doing what they pandered and said they would do and repeal it and replace it. But what are you bowing over? They're fixing a mess your administration created. You're the original loser. That's number one. Number two, he goes, I think part of this, this whole NFL thing, is to distract people from Puerto Rico. What, did Donald Trump go in there blowing at the top of his lungs? And where's the substance? What has Donald Trump failed to do in Puerto Rico? What do you have to do with the hurricanes? What happened with health care? What happened with North Korea? You mean the North Korea that your former president for eight years kicked the can to this president and Bush for eight years before him? That's the time bomb we've allowed to just tick in Iran and North Korea by kicking the can and not doing anything. This is a problem. I'm, look, I'm not a, I'm not the biggest fan of Donald Trump in the world, but these are problems you all created that he inherited. I mean, some have hijacked it to make it about race and black history, let alone never mind Kaepernick and Michael Brown. This guy's making it about North Korea, Puerto Rico. We're going to blame the chlamydia on Trump next. I'll see you the next time on Savage Nation. God bless. Savage.